Good morning, my friends. Pastor Daniel and myself, we would like to welcome you to our Wednesday morning time of reflection and meditation. And if you're watching this, you're probably watching it a little bit later than it's normally scheduled because we've had some transmission issues here at the church in getting our things uh, recorded and our telephones and so forth. So we're getting those fixed. But if you're watching this, it means you finally got on. And we hope that you are watching us. Wherever you are at, welcome. We're glad that you're with us today. Three brief announcements. First of all, this coming Sunday is All Saints Sunday. And it's an important time of the year when we remember those who have been a part of our fellowship, those who have graced us with their presence and their, their lives, who have shared with us their journeys. And we're going to be remembering those individuals this Sunday. We're going to be sharing their names and ringing the bell in their honor. And we want to be sure you're here and give you a chance uh, to have the opportunity to stand as their names are read and to be a witness to their life and perhaps to their ministry as Christians within our fellowship. So that's this coming Sunday, All Saints Sunday, here at Val de Rose. And then we want to be sure that you know you're invited to our in-person Thanksgiving service on November 25th. It's going to be at 10 o'clock in the morning, and it'll be about an hour long, and we hope that you come and uh, have yourselves enriched and perhaps think anew and afresh about the power of Thanksgiving and what it means in the true biblical sense. And then finally, keep on your date our charge conference on December 4th, and that'll be here at the church. It's going to be in person. It will be in Moore Hall, and we are looking forward to that time when we can gather and to celebrate this past year of ministry at the church. So I think that's the announcements, Daniel. Anything else? I think that's it. My friends, join with Pastor Daniel and myself in our call to worship. What joy it is to have you here today. We have come from very busy lives filled both with joys and difficulties. Welcome to this place in which God will ease your burdens and celebrate your joys with you. We have come to find hope and peace in our lives. Whatever has happened this week in your life, know that God is with you in offering you peace, rest, and blessing. Thanks be to God who accepts us as we are. And thanks for the warm welcome in this service of worship. Amen. Please join with me in prayer. Lord, we have come to you this day bringing all that we have, our lives, our hopes and dreams, our fears and sorrows. We place thee before you, these before you in faith and hope, knowing that no matter what has happened, you are with us and blessing us. Open our hearts to receive your words and your spirit, that we may find healing and comfort. Open our lives to the wondrous possibilities for service and joy that you offer to us. Ease our minds and spirits that we may hear the words of encouragement and peace this day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Daniel. The responsive reading from the Psalter is Psalm 127. Unless the Lord builds a house, the work of the builders is wasted. Unless the Lord protects a city, guarding it with sentries will do no good. It is useless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, anxiously working for food to eat, for God gives rest to his loved ones. Children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from him. Children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hands. How joyful is the man whose quiver is full of them. He will not be put to shame when he confronts his accusers at the city gates. As we come to a time of renewal today, I'm going to share a few words with you 
about those things that draw us to a time of renewal and confession. And then Pastor Daniel will lead us in our prayer of confession and our words of assurance. Gracious God, so often we look at ourselves, our gifts and our talents, and wonder what you would do with these offerings. We don't think that we have much to give. So far too many times we belittle the gifts and turn our backs on the needs and opportunities present to serve, believing that our gifts cannot possibly make a difference. We think that we must possess the greatest of talents and wealth in order to truly please and serve you. How foolish we are. Our prayer of confession this morning. Forgive us when we stop listening to your healing and comforting words and focus on our anxieties. Heal us, Lord. Help us know that you have given to us such blessings and that these blessings are truly wonderful and meant to be used to joy and service to others. Help us to bring our lives just as they are to you and to receive your gentle touch and healing grace. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God has given to each one of us such blessings and talents. With joy, we bring these gifts to God. You are blessed by God's absolute love for you. Rejoice in that love and find healing and hope. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you too are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, you have placed before us your wonderful world with its blessings and its difficulties. You have called us to be peacemakers and people who will work for you, offering our lives and our gifts in your service. But we sometimes hold back from trusting in these gifts you have given to us. We wonder if they will be enough to make a difference. And we become caught in the trap of believing that only the largest gifts have any worth. Forgive us when we slide so easily into our fears of inadequacy. Each of us has been blessed, and each is called to be a blessing. There are no small and insignificant gifts for God to bless and use. Free us from our fears of not enough and help us to joyfully place our hopes, our dreams, and our lives in your care. We lift to you this day those individuals who are seeking your healing, mercies, and comforting power. Be with them, Lord. Strengthen them in mind and body and spirit. And help us to feel those same mercies and comfort active in our lives, reminding us that your love is poured out on us so that we may serve. Strengthen and encourage us as we move forward in ministry, seeking to be good stewards of all that you have given us. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, the reading from the Old Testament <clears throat> comes from the book of Ruth, a selection from chapters 3, 1 through 5, and chapter 4, 13 to 17. One day, Naomi said to Ruth, My daughter, it's time that I found a permanent home for you so that you will be provided for. Boaz is a close relative of ours, and he's been very kind by letting you gather grain with his young women. Tonight, he will be winnowing barley at the threshing floor. Now do as I tell you. Take a bath and put on perfume and dress in your nicest clothes. Then go to the threshing floor, but don't let Boaz see you until he has finished eating and drinking. 
Be sure to notice where he lies down. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down there. He will tell you what to do. I will do everything you say, Ruth replied. Verse 14 of chapter 4. So Boaz took Ruth into his home, and she became his wife. When he slept with her, the Lord enabled her to become pregnant, and she gave birth to a son. Then the women of the town said to Naomi, Praise the Lord, who has now provided a redeemer for your family. May this child be famous in Israel. May he restore your youth and care for you in your old age. For he is the son of your daughter-in-law who loves you and has been better to you than seven sons. Naomi took the baby and cuddled him to her breast. And she cared for him as if he were her own. The neighbor women said, now at least Naomi has a son again. And they named him Obed. He became the father of Jesse and the grandfather of David. This ends the lesson. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, here we are back on Ruth again. And even though Ruth is not part of the lectionary selection for this coming Sunday, that is for the All Saints passages, I wanted to continue with Ruth this week and talk a little bit about uh, what Daniel and myself started last week. And last week's commentary on Ruth 1, 1 through 18, I spent some time talking about the centrality of Naomi in the book of Ruth. And we looked at the pastoral concerns around that wonderful passage last week. Today we're going to think a little bit about the theological implications in this whole narrative, but do it from Naomi's perspective. The book of Ruth was probably most likely composed during what scholars call the early post-exilic period for example, around the 6th to the 4th centuries BCE. And this was during a time when particular theological understandings were dominant. And if you read carefully the book of Ruth, what you find in it are theological assertions that are also made in other Hebrew books, particularly the book of Deuteronomy. And what you can say is that the book of Ruth kind of drives a deuteronomic theology. It kind of underpins the entire narrative. And what that means is that there is the notion that obedience to God leads to blessings and that disobedience results in no blessings or worse, in a curse. Moreover, the faith Phil belief that God hears and cares for the people of Israel. There's the assurance of divine providence. That's all part of the theology you find in Deuteronomy and Joshua and Judges. And you also find that theology being driven in the book of Ruth. Well, at least we could say in part in the book of Ruth. Because even though you get this Deuteronomic theology in Boaz's speeches and actions in the book of Ruth, um, you don't necessarily get it um, in other parts. Boaz, yes, he invokes God repeatedly in what you might call the conventional blessings of the day and the greetings of the day. So he kind of represents a theological compass in the book of Ruth. But it's interesting and you don't really catch this so much in first reading of Ruth, but the theological assertions of Boaz are challenged strongly by Naomi all the way through this book. And this back and forth is what makes the book so interesting. And unfortunately, when we read it in the English translations, we don't get a lot of this. It comes out more in the, in the, um, the Hebrew and very fine Hebrew scholars will, will take time to point this out. But let me highlight a couple things here. What you find 
in this book is Naomi speaking about God more than any other character in the narrative. Naomi talks about God, and she alternates between using the divine name Yahweh and another name or moniker for God, which is Almighty, which means Shaddai, Shaddai. Well, this is somewhat ironic when you think about it, because here is Naomi using the term Shaddai or Almighty, but that's a term that's used all through Hebrew Bible stories that speak about fertility and blessings. And the irony here is that Naomi believes that there's no fertility taking place in her life and in her family at the time that she's going through these experiences. And she feels like she has not been blessed by God. So why is she using this term, should I, in the midst of these circumstances? Well, the reality is that Naomi challenges the work and even the identity of God is one who brings blessings in life. She's saying kind of perhaps like we do sometimes, yeah, I, I believe that, yep, that's what I'm supposed to say, but I'm really kind of challenging it too because I'm not so sure I really believe it. Her ambivalence comes out as she uses this term, should I? I think it's important to point out too that notions of sin or guilt do not factor in to this narrative at all. And what I mean by that is that if you look through the Old Testament, the Hebrew books, the country of Moab is really maligned all the time. It's presented very negatively in the biblical narrative. You read about that in Deuteronomy, in Isaiah. In fact, Moab is an enemy. And yet when you read the book of Ruth, the country of Moab figures fairly large. But yet there's no indication that the decision to seek refuge in Moab or that the marriage of Naomi's two sons to Moabite women is somehow the cause of their grief, which could somehow perhaps have been a form of punishment for that happening. It's not there. The fact that the narrative leaves out any explanation for Naomi's grief and suffering actually intensifies the reader's empathy for Naomi. But the country of Moab and the connection with Moab is never seen as a negative thing in itself at all in this story. Another point is that the absence of explanation around Naomi's grief and suffering amplifies her complaints. It highlights the disconnect she feels from God. In chapter 1, Naomi openly states that God's will has somehow come out against her. We read that in verse 13. We talked about that last week. We read that God has made her bitter. We read that in verse 20 of chapter 1. And also that God has returned her empty to Bethlehem. We read that in verse 21. And we also read that God has testified against her. We read that in verse 21. Those are powerfully negative statements about how she feels about God and understands her connection with God. And I think it's worth pointing out that Naomi makes her complaints about God rather than to God makes her complaints about God rather than to God. If you go to other biblical characters like Job and Jeremiah, they make very similar complaints about God as does Naomi, but they speak directly to God, directly to deity to voice their complaint. And this is really kind of emphasizing again that Naomi's experience of abandonment by God is so great that she can't even bear to look at God right now. It's like, get out of here. I don't even want to see your face. Well, another point here. Her speech, Naomi's speech to her daughters-in-law, in chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, illustrate this point very strongly. In verse 8, she makes a surprising, often glossed over claim. She says, this is Naomi speaking, 
May the Lord deal faithfully with you just as you have done with the dead and with me. And when you read between the lines on that quote, I'm going to say it again. May the Lord deal faithfully with you just as you have done with the dead and with me. What Naomi's really saying here is that she wishes that her daughter's-in-law's actions might serve as a model for God, whose actions thus far in her experience have contradicted her understanding. Complications continue in the Hebrew text of verse 9, in which the sentence cuts off and begins again quite abruptly. This is not something we see very often in the original language of the Hebrew Bible. But it's as if Naomi started to say something, and then she stopped, and she just changed her mind. And this is recorded in the Hebrew. Jeremy Shipper renders the Hebrew in this way, where it sounds like this. May Yahweh, may Yahweh give to you, like she's going to say something positive, may Yahweh give to you, and then it's followed actually in the Hebrew with these words, oh, just forget it, just forget it. So, may Yahweh give to you, oh, just forget it. And then it goes on, find rest, each one in the household of your husband. Her uncertainty here, Naomi's uncertainty with regard to God's presence and working in her life is very, very clear. The uncertainty of Naomi's blessings in chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, finds an unexpected answer in chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, because it is Naomi herself that will seek Ruth's rest and security. Naomi will find security and rest for Ruth. My daughter, shouldn't I seek security for you so that things might go well for you? And as we noted last week, Naomi's silence at the end of the narrative in chapter 4 and verses 16 and 17, it just highlights the continuation of her grief. And it also suggests that her perspective on God has remained unchanged even in the midst of new blessings. She finds security. Uh, she finds a son who's considered by the women in the village to be her son. It's not biologically, but it's seen that way by the people in the community. Wonderful blessing. And yet her view of God remains unchallenged. There might have been a real stubborn streak in this woman, Naomi. I don't know. But throughout the book of Ruth, Naomi repeatedly presents us with this theological perspective that is rooted in the opportunity and ability to question, to challenge, and even embrace doubts. She struggles to comprehend the world she's experiencing, the pain, the grief, because it contradicts her preconceived Deuteronomic theologies. She, <clears throat> She knows clearly in her mind that you can live a good life and not necessarily find the blessings of God. That's what the book of Deuteronomy teaches. That's what Boaz teaches. That's what Ruth generally has as its lodestar in its theology. But that's not what Ruth experiences in her life. And friends, that's the way it is with a lot of people we know. Maybe it's that way even in your life and in my life. Certainly there's been times when we've done all the right things in our mind, we've done everything to honor our neighbor, to believe in God and trust God and follow God. We go to church. We do all the things we believe we should do. And there may be a sense that we feel like God ought to bless us for that. But sometimes the blessings don't come. And this is part of real life. This is part of what happens. It happened with Job. It happens with Naomi. And we see it with other biblical characters. But what a thing to be aware of as we stand on the doorstep of All Saints Sunday. When we, in the midst of everything, nonetheless, we still 
affirm God's presence and God's love for us, even amidst the things of life that we cannot always control. It's important to acknowledge that Naomi's theological perspectives, even though they're a little radical, they're not condemned in this book. They may be countered by Boaz's theology, but that does not wash away Naomi's theological concerns. Both Boaz and Naomi bring a point of view to the table that needs to be considered. And as we said before, in the end, Naomi still receives the blessings of children and redemption in spite of all of this. So the book of Ruth, from Naomi's point of view, offers a theological perspective that embraces questions and leaves space for anger, for frustration, and it also highlights the fact that free will is at work. Given the uncertainty felt with regards to God's presence and actions, Boaz and uh, Ruth work together. Ruth and Naomi work together, and they do it for the security and the redemption and the well-being of one another. It's interesting if you listen carefully to the scripture that Pastor Daniel read a little while ago, that when Ruth is told to go and to be there with Boaz and make herself available to him as a mate, and of course they get together, and she becomes pregnant and has a child, and that child eventually becomes the grandfather of David which preserves the line in the Old Testament all the way through one little link in the chain that leads to Jesus Christ. It it preserves the Davidic line. And my friends, there's so much here to be said about free will interacting with the circumstances of life and how we make choices and how we can step into situations that it can affect outcomes that are way down the road. And these opportunities are given to us by God. Uh, Free will works with divine sovereignty in very, very mysterious ways. So I'll I'll wrap this up here. Ruth, Ruth calls upon Boaz to be a comfort for her and Naomi in chapter 3 and verse 9 using the language of what you would call God's prevenient care. And what I mean by that is Naomi seeks security for Ruth on her own. She actually is willing to give up her blessing in chapter 1 of verse 9 to do that. And in doing that, she shows the transformative power of human free will. So the theology of the book of Ruth celebrates the ways in which we can care for one another when the world seems to be crashing down around us, even amidst our doubts. Ruth and Naomi, all through the book, they cling to one another. There's a special Hebrew word for that called debak, and they cling to one another. And it means that they're more than just clingy people. They cling to each other to support one another because they love one another. Both women are women of worth, and the whole narrative through this book honors both of their experiences and their perspectives. And for a book of only four chapters long, Daniel, it is really a complex little piece of work. What would you add to this? The book of Ruth also, in in its theological sense, it also affords us. The book of Ruth and its uh, theological component and the structure, it also affords us a glimpse to be able to see um, how also the actions of uh, three individuals, uh, Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz, how that is also meant to impact um, um, as a blessing a community. How that community now becomes uh, a better, if you will. Um, I think that the... 
the book of Ruth beginning with famine and death. And then the story of Ruth ends with community harvest and rejoicing over the birth of a baby. Uh, the narrator's portrait of Bethlehem in the concluding scenes in chapter 4 offers a vision, perhaps, of that uh, harmonious uh, community that is blessed because they have uh, uh, opportunity to be able to welcome the stranger, to be inclusive of uh, um, bringing in those that perhaps are not like them or haven't been a part of their uh, surrounding of their town or their village for some time. But they also provide to feed the poor and the hungry where all eventually get to eat. All are fed. And it maybe makes up for a joyful community of sorts. In Ruth, in the book of Ruth, we have the leading man of an Israelite village and a poor Moabite woman who become married. And they do so by the blessing of the community elders. And many others gather around from the community to, to join in the celebration. The child of this union is celebrated by the women of this town as he is placed, taken to the arms of Naomi. The continuing bond between Ruth and Naomi is highlighted as the women of that village compare Ruth's value to that of seven sons. The portrait, again, of the community may be regarded at a, as a microcosm of the peaceable kingdom that is envisioned, uh, perhaps by the, by the prophetic tradition. However, there's also a twist by scholars or people that commit themselves to study the structure, the origin, the meaning, the purpose, the metaphors found within the book of Ruth. Um, I, I, found it, I find it quite interesting to me that there's one Hebrew word, hemes, that stands out on behalf of uh, um, Ruth in terms of uh, um, manifesting kindness, if you will, uh, not only to uh, Naomi, but also to Boaz and others. The way that Ruth manifests and maintains that kindness, also known as loyalty. And yet, we have modern day scholars that offer, offer us opportunities to look at it in a different way. <clears throat> in a different way. I mean, I, I, I was really curious when I came across this one scholar by the name of, she's a professor of Old Testament, uh, Catherine Sackenfeld. And uh, she's, she's very bright. But I think she also plays with this twist as she writes the following. She says that first and foremost, the marriage of a woman to a wealthy man will therefore now guarantee the long-term economic security of women. Furthermore, she adds, that others point to the celebration of a boy child and the reference to Rachel and Leah, as in chapter 4, verse 11, that these are indications that the narrative implicitly devalues girls. And yet, one more mention that she, ha that she makes is that others are concerned over the role given to Naomi in relation to the baby, such as uh, chapter 4, verses 16 and 17 fearing a basis for reinscribing, reinstituting customs in which mothers' roles are denigrated in favor of a grandmother's authority. Yeah, all those three things are exact to be found, to be contained within the uh, cultural, societal traditions within the Old Testament. It, it was very, mad, very much a man's world in the Old Testament. I'm not sure, though, that I agree with these twists, but I found it curious how, you know, it kind of makes sense at first. But we need to be careful as we read into it a little bit further. Is that really what it's saying in the text? Is that really what it is implying or is is there some sort of a of a um, 
implicit application that I'm trying to subscribe to it. And at times, that tends to happen with the way that we read the scriptures, the way that we would perhaps interpret the scriptures. I was so curious by this that I actually had conversations with a couple, a man and a woman, and I also had a conversation with another woman, an older woman, retired elder, specifically about this. And they they agree with me that that's not exactly what is being said here, that that's not true entirely. It may be a shadow of something that is trying to be said regarding the customs and the societal culture of the Old Testament. In essence, I think in every instance, we eventually are going to have to choose which aspect of the text we find authoritative and which aspect we will not seek to preserve in our culture or in our societal structure. Today, for example, it's unlikely for, inst- for us that modern Western culture will think of replicating community decision-making in the same exact procedures used at the town gate in the book of Ruth particularly the system where when decisions were made, there was the removal of a shoe by both parties. We don't do that. We don't apply that. But I think it was worthwhile to kind of look into it a little bit further. And there's a there's an old saying that, that, that says a lot in it that, you know, Let's look at it this way. Let's be careful that we don't throw out the baby with the bathwater as well. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, I think um, I appreciate you delving into that. And I, I think sometimes contemporary interpreters, Daniel, um, are, are quick to want to move beyond the context of the original passage to filter everything through the contemporary liberation or feminist theology. And it really um, concerns me when we do that. I think it's, it's, it's good to read it. We, we know that the world today is different than back then. We know it was a patriarchal society. We know that they lived in a society that was, if you and I walk back in that world, we wouldn't know what we're doing because it's so, it's so different. But I checked out a number of um, feminist perspectives and, and uh, liberation theologians and consulted what they said about the text for today. And some raised very interesting points, and I think some were absolutely wacko, okay? And I'm being really honest with you. <laughs> and I don't care if they've got an MA or a PhD by their name. I think they've just completely missed the point. So that's where good critical judgment comes in to play, and um, but this is a um, th- this is a powerful book. I mean, it does certainly point that we are in a different place today as we think about world and relationships between people. But the book is always is also so very powerful to me because it, it does bring up different theological perspectives, and you know, and if you read it carefully. And I think the Hebrew is really much more descriptive. And I'm not an expert in Hebrew. I, you know, I'm familiar with it a, a degree, okay. But, but when Naomi sets up this encounter between Ruth and Boaz on the threshing floor, it's Naomi who's driving it. She's yes. setting up the seduction of Ruth toward Boaz. Mm-hmm. Okay, she knows exactly what she's doing. And so if we think she's passive... If we think she's not acting, if we think she's not independent, we're just dead wrong. This is one strong woman who's at work here, as I think many were in that, in that ancient time. And if she hadn't have done that, the messianic hope may well have died on the, on the uh, threshing floor instead of, instead of being pulled off, if you know what I mean. And, and, that's, and that's where at times a lot of these modern-day liberation theologians tend to miss it. Yes. They leave the theological foundational truth 
because it may not sound too popular. Yes. But it's the theological foundational principles that are there. How, how could an angry woman perhaps a bitter angry woman yep. be an instrument yeah. of God? Exactly. That, that doesn't fit. That doesn't happen. But wait a minute. And yet here it is. What are the theological opportunities of that? <laughs> That's right. Oh, is this a shadow an example of grace? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And that ultimately God accomplishes his pur purposes with imperfect people. Yes. And people who seem to have very little, but God uses their weaknesses. Yes. To create great strengths. Yes. That's the theolo theology that I want to continue to pursue. Right. Yep. That's right. That's where I want to put my feet on and walk on. I agree. Because God, <laughs> that brings hope to me. That brings hope to us that I'm trying to do my best. Yep. And even when I don't, you are gracious enough upon my life. Yeah, that's right. That's good theology, I yeah, think. I think it is. <laughs> that dog will hunt, as they say in the South. <laughs> Daniel, go ahead and finish us off here with our Lord's Prayer. <laughs> and now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. And friends, again, we remind you, this Sunday, All Saints Sunday, come and worship with us, or watch it online. One way or another, join with us, please. And now, go forth in these words of comfort to live as God's people of abundance while not giving in to the pull of our culture. You're going to need the power of the Holy Spirit. Lift your hands and hearts in the name of the Father who sustains us and the Son who instructs us and the Spirit who leads us. Go forth to love and serve the Lord, the one who loves the widow and the orphan. Sing the Lord's song of hope in dry lands. Amen. 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 Go in peace. <laughs>